singing tonight, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 6, and uh, I'm going to start off by telling a joke that Brother Frank told me tonight, <laughs> break the ice a little bit. Uh, he, he asked me, he said, do you know how the man on the moon cuts his hair? He eclipses it. <laughs> Figured that was fitting for, since we had the eclipse this week. Um, Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We're going to be talking about Gideon. Um, honestly, when, when Pastor asked me to preach, I, I had something in mind that um, I felt God gave me, and as, the, as time went on, um, I was praying even today, and I'm like, God, I, I don't feel settled in this. What do you want me to do? And God said, I want you to completely change your direction, and I want you to go somewhere totally different. Um, we're on Gideon in uh, Sunday school with the teens, and it's just, it's really stood out to me. There's something very specific about the story that maybe there's other preachers that have preached on it before, but I can tell you, I don't know that I've ever heard it personally. Um, and it really just, it changed my view of Gideon. It changed my view of how God views us. And tonight, um, for a few minutes, we're going to be talking about how Gideon lacked God confidence. He didn't necessarily lack self-confidence, though he did, but most importantly, he lacked God confidence. If you would stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word, we're going to start in Judges chapter 6, and we'll start in verse number 12. Judges chapter 6, verse number 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for tonight. God, there's so many around the globe right now that can't meet openly like we can God, if they did, they would be persecuted. They would possibly be put to death. They would be jailed. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have. And Lord, it is a privilege that I think we take for granted far too often to be able to open your word. God, I pray that you would just be with us tonight. God, give us something from your word. Lord, set me aside. God, allow me to be used by you and speak through me, God, that it's, it's in spite of me, Lord. I don't deserve to be up here. God, set my pride aside and just give us something from your word tonight as we study the life of Gideon. Be with Pastor, Lord. Help them to have a great time in Florida. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So let's kind of set the stage here a little bit. We've got Gideon here who um, we find that in the verse prior, verse 11, he's um, hiding in the wine press. He, he's threshing the wheat to hide it from the Midianites. Uh, there's some people who say that he was, you know, a wimp because he was hiding. I think personally that he was doing the smart thing. He was trying to keep the food where the Midianites wouldn't steal it. If you read the beginning of the chapter, it really sets the stage and tells us that the Midianites have come in and essentially taken rule over the children of Israel. Um, the Midianites, as soon as it's harvest time, they come in, they plunder, they pillage, they take all of the grain, all of the stuff that the children of Israel had grown. They even take the cattle, they take the lambs, they take everything uh, the Bible says that the number of the Midianites and their camels was without number. Um, we'll, we'll kind of see how many people as we get a little bit into the story. But there's all these people, and so Gideon here is just trying to get some food for his family. He's down in the wine press. He's trying to just get some wheat um, to make some bread, and the angel of the Lord appears to him. And the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon, and Gideon doesn't say a word. The first words that we have recorded in this conversation are essentially God speaking to Gideon, saying, and it says it here in verse number 12, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. God sets the stage. 
God begins the conversation with Gideon by saying, hey, Gideon, I'm going to be with you through what's to come, and you are a mighty man of valor. Now, Gideon had two responses to this, and he did not choose, I would say he did not choose the correct one. He could have said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Okay, you're, you're with me? You're with me? What is it that you want me to do? But instead, Gideon goes back to God, and he says, who am I? I'm from one of the lowest tribes in Israel. Not only that, my family is one of the poorest tribes in or poorest of that tribe. And of that family, I'm the lowest. What do you want with me? I can't do anything. Gideon looks at, at the angel of God, and there's people here who say that this would be a Christophany, which would be an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. God's talking through the angel and talking to Gideon and saying, I'm with you, and you're a mighty man. And Gideon says, oh, hold up. Do you know who you're talking to? Gideon didn't have con the confidence in himself that God did. If we start looking more at the story, we're going to jump down a little bit, jump down to verse number 36. Verse number 36, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand... As thou hast said, behold, I'll put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and if it be dry, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed out the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me. And I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. He's already done this once. He's doing it again now. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that, uh, that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Okay, so we see that Gideon's kind of putting God to the test here. We see it also happen a little bit earlier in the chapter, but this is kind of the big miracle, if you will. It would be kind of crazy if you woke up and only a fleece was wet on the ground that you could wring a bowl of water out of it, nothing else was wet. And then it would be also crazy the next day if the fleece was bone dry and everything else was wet. So Gideon said, okay, God, you, you've proved yourself and we're going to keep reading a little bit into chapter 7, but I want us to go back to verse number 16. Because this is what really stood out to me when reading the story of Gideon. Verse number 16, And the Lord said unto him, so God is talking, Lord in your Bible there is all uppercase, that's Jehovah, said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. He reassures him again. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as, what are those next two words? Y'all tell me. As one man. God tells Gideon, hey, I want you to smite the Midianites as one person. We know the story of Gideon. We'll read it here in a second, but that's not what happens. Gideon does not smite the Midianites as one man. You see, we'll go to chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people... 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. We'll stop right there, um, and I'll just kind of summarize the rest of it. We know next God tells him that, hey, these 10,000 people that are remaining, that's too many. Go down to the river, and those who put their head in the water separate into one side, and those who pick the water up in their hand and lap it like a dog separate those into another group. And at the end of the day, Gideon is left with 300 men. 300 men up against approximately 135,000 Midianites. The odds are not with the children of Israel, but I want you to realize something. If we go back to verse 16, what does the Bible say? And thou shalt smite the Midianites as what? God didn't want 300. 
God wanted one person. That one person lacked so much confidence in themselves that they didn't believe that God could use them in that way and said, you can't use me, so you need to find another way. Here's the thing, God still did. God allowed Gideon to limit God. Think about that. God allows his creation, his fallible, his finite creation that has fallen and lives in sin, he allows us to limit him, an infinite God, the creator. He can do anything. He doesn't need us. But he allows us to limit him. It's humbling. Gideon here, think of, think of how the story would have went if Gideon would, allow, would have allowed God to use him in the way that God wanted to. Think of how the story would have went if Gideon is one person, obviously with the backing of God, slew the entire army of Midian. It would have been a very different story. But instead, all throughout, I mean, we skipped quite a few verses, and in those verses, Gideon made excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse why he couldn't do it. How often do we do that? How often does God come and he knocks on our hearts and he says, hey, I want you to go do this, and we're like, but I can't. And God says, okay, but I'm with you. <laughs> but, but I can't. Okay, but I'm with you. He tells us again, I'm with you. Yeah, but that's too much for me. That's not something I can do. And God's like, okay, but this is what I want to do through you. Because he started off just by telling Gideon that he was going to use Gideon to save the children of Israel. But then God, more, God got more specific, and he's like, you're going to smite the entire armies. Gideon's like, uh-uh. No, that's not happening. To the point where he went out, God said, I want to use you as one man. He went out and got 32,000 soldiers together. That's a lot more than one. God still used him, though. How often do we put ourselves in that very situation? Number one, God saw a mighty man in Gideon, even though Gideon himself saw himself as just this small, puny thing. You see, at the end of the day, we're all just dirt. It's not special about any one of us. None of us were made of any better dirt than other people. We're all equally, truthfully, without God, we're all equally worthless. God is the only thing worth full about us as, as humans. We're fallen. We deserve to burn and die in hell for what we did to God, to Jesus. The fact that humankind was thrust into sin when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we don't deserve anything. God gave us perfection and we ruined it. Yet God comes down and before Gideon can even say a single word of I'm not worth anything, God said, Gideon, you're a mighty man. He didn't say, Gideon, I want you to to go to ROTC, and then I want you to go to officer candidate school, and then I want you to go serve 20 years in the armed forces, and then once you do that, I want you to rise to the highest rank, and then I'll use you. It's not what God said. God went to this guy that was hiding in a wine press just trying to get some bread for his family, and God said, you're mighty, I want to use you. We'd look at Gideon and be like, mighty, what are you talking about? He doesn't come from a big family. Gideon's family isn't royalty. Gideon's family isn't known for being the best warriors in the land. Gideon, there's no money in that family. Why would you pick that one? There's so many other better people that you could have picked, God. And God said, no, no, no. I want that one. That one's special to me. The one that nobody thinks anything of, that is the special one. The one that nobody cares about. The one that doesn't even care about himself, that's the one I want. How amazing is God? How awesome is God that he comes to the people who don't even really think anything of themselves? God saw a mighty man in Gideon even though he saw himself as small. It's crazy. It's crazy. 
I mean, even verse number 14, God already tells Gideon that he sent him. Gideon's response to the whole thing is, well, if you're really God, then why are we in this situation? He just made excuses. God still wanted to use him. God wanted to use Gideon alone, but Gideon didn't believe in himself. And here's the kicker. He didn't believe in the power of God. He didn't believe that God could use him in the way that God wanted to use him. I mean, we're reminded of this in the New Testament. Jesus is in the garden. He tells Peter that Peter's going to deny him three times. And what is Peter's response to, to Jesus? No, I'm not going to do that. Jesus, the Creator, just looked at Peter, the person who they followed that they knew was perfect. Jesus just told Peter, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. And Peter's like, I'm going to die with you. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. I would never do that to you, Lord. God looks at us each and every day and he's like, hey, I've provided for you. Those bills that you didn't know how to pay, I paid those. That time that you didn't know how you were going to put food on the table, I put food there. When you didn't know how to put gas in your car, I put gas in it. When you didn't know how to make it another day because you were in such grief, I was there for you. And we look back at God and say, okay, but this situation's different. We look back at him and we're like, okay, but like, yeah, you, you did that back then, but are you going to do it again? That's what Gideon said here in verse number 13. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of? He's literally looking at God and saying, are you really the same God that, that our fathers told us existed? Like, are you sure? They didn't have the Bible back then to read like we do now, so we can read all of these stories. But we do the same thing. We look at God and we say, okay, yeah, you provided for me back then. And I've heard these stories of all these pastors who, when they were in times of trouble, they had somebody come and just drop food at their doorstep when they didn't have any food in the cupboard. And they sat down at the table to eat, not knowing where the food was going to come from. And you delivered food. And we look at God and we're like, okay, but yeah, would you really do that? That's what Gideon is saying here. He didn't believe in the power of God. And eventually, Gideon did let God use him, but not in the way that God wanted to. God wanted to use Gideon alone. And Gideon said, no, 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 you're going to have to use me with 32,000 of my closest friends. And then God's like, that's too many. You need to get rid of them. Tell them if they want to go home early that they can go home early. And so 22,000 went home. Okay, now I want to see who's going to be actually watching what's going on and who's not going to have a care in the world what's going on. And we got rid of another 9,700 and we're down to 300. And even then, God told Gideon when he was going to go down and talk to the host of people, God told him to go alone. And God also said, but if you're afraid, you can take this other person with you. And he took the other person with him. The whole time, Gideon lacked not just self-confidence, but God-confidence. God wanted to do something so mighty with Gideon, and he did. I mean, 300 versus 135,000, I'd say the odds were not in their favor. But the odds are always in God's favor. If God is with you, if God tells you, I'm going to be with you when you do this, he means it. God's never lied. God can't lie. So if he tells you, I'm with you, he's with you. It doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what Gideon thought. God was with them so much so that as you go further into the story, when they get up on the hillside, all 300 of them, not a whole lot of people, and they break their jars that they have and they hold up their sword in one hand and a, a light in the other and they say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, the Midianites go crazy and kill each other. About 120,000 of them slew each other in the valley. Because 300 people held up a light and a sword on a hill. They didn't do it. They didn't have this huge sound system and all of these choppers flying in overhead and all of this stuff coming in. They just had God. 
I mean, in reality, how much did the Midianites actually hear from a hundred people on a hillside? God came in and did that, but God wanted to do it with one person. Gideon defeated the armies, and he was a great judge for Israel for 40 years after that, but he could have done so much more if he didn't have to do it his own way. So often I feel like we get stuck in what we want to do. God, I want you to use me in this way. God, I want to do this. And God says, okay, but I want you to do this. And God's like, hold on. Who's God here? I told you to go do this. Look at the story of Jonah. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah went the opposite way. God reminded him who was God. Too often, God will come to us and say, hey, I have this plan for you. When I, when I surrendered to be a pastor, to be a preacher, to be whatever God wanted me to be when I was 14 years old, I wanted to do what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be in technology. I wanted to be the CEO of a company. I wanted to make a bunch of money. I wanted to play with technology all day. That, that's what I wanted to do. And everybody told me I would be great at it. I grew up in a family that was really technologically uh, advanced. We, you know, if somebody had a problem with their computer at church, they would call us, we'd fix it, my dad or, or myself, and we did all of that stuff, and that was my plan, and God said, I want you to preach, and I said, hold up, what? Why me? I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to stand up in front of people and talk. That's not what I want, and God said, no, no, no that's, that's my plan for you, though. And so through a lot of arguing with God, he won, and here I am, and guess what? I've worked in technology for years. God gave me what my dream was, but it didn't have the same allure as it used to. There's nothing in the world like standing up either behind this pulpit, behind the pulpit in the teen room, anywhere, and preaching the Word of God. I would rather do that than touch a piece of technology any day of the world. And if you would have asked me that 15 years ago, I would have said you were crazy. But I gave up what God, or what I wanted for what God wanted. Pastors told a similar story how he didn't think that he would ever want to speak in front of people, but he just gave himself to God and look at what God did. God came to Gideon and said, Gideon, I want to use you. And instead of Gideon saying, here my Lord, send me, he said, why are you coming to me? If Gideon would have gotten out of his own way, God could have used him in so many different ways. If we would get out of our own way, God could use us in so many different ways. We live in a day and age where we are more connected than ever before, but also more disconnected than ever before. If you go back and you look at some of these preachers of old, these people who memorized whole portions of the Bible, these people that you could ask them essentially any question in the Bible and they would have an answer for you, why was that? Well, because they sold out to God, not to TikTok or to Instagram or to Facebook. When they had free time, they read the Bible. They didn't read their friend's statuses. They were focused on God, not themselves. And guess what? I, I am a social media influencer. I live in that world. That is part of how God has allowed me to make an income for the past several years but so far, too often, we put so much more time, effort, energy into that than we do into the Bible. Reading the Bible is not just for the preacher. Reading the Bible is not just for the Sunday school teacher. Studying the Bible is not just for the preacher. The Bible doesn't say, preachers, study to show thyself approved. The Bible tells us all to. God wants to use us. We just have to get out of our own way. Think about it this way, and I've heard a similar illustration before, and I kind of used a similar illustration on Sunday with the teens when we were in Gideon. We were talking about this. But when I was studying this afternoon, God gave me just kind of a little bit deeper thought with this. I want you to imagine a glove, okay? Any type of glove. We're going to talk about a glove that maybe a doctor would wear. If that doctor was to go into surgery and he left that glove back on the table, 
And he scrubbed up and his hands were sterilized and everything and he just went in there and did it. Did the glove do anything? No. Did the glove have any part in that job? No. But if that doctor went in and he scrubbed up and he put that glove on and he went in there and he did that job, did the glove itself do the job? No. The doctor still did it, but he did it through the glove. That glove isn't sentient. It, it can't do anything in and of itself. We're the same way. We are that glove to God. God could come into this earth and he could do every single thing that he wants to do. But he chooses to use us as his glove and bring us along for the ride. He chooses to work through us in spite of us. He's just putting us on as the glove. Gideon didn't do anything special here. Gideon didn't go down and kill those armies. He just stood up on a hillside and broke a pot and held up a lamp and a sword. He didn't do anything. God did. But Gideon was his glove. God wants to use you as his glove to do something. It could be to reach a family member. It could be to reach a coworker. It could be to train up your child in the way you should go. God wants to use you, but for him to use you, you have to get out of your own way. Let's go back to that glove real quick. Let's say that the doctor picks up the glove, and when he goes to put the glove on, it's missing the thumb, the index finger, and, and the ring finger. It's still a glove. It's still able to be used but not in the same way as if it was a whole glove. Gideon was used here, but imagine if he would have let God work through him how God wanted to. With our lives, it's no different. With my life, it's no different. God wants to use me, and too often I get in his way. And he'll still choose to use me. He'll still find different ways to use me, but it might not be the way that he wanted to. He still used Gideon. He still used Gideon to free the children of Israel from the uh, Midianites. He still used Gideon in order to get them to where they didn't have to be afraid of their food. And for 40 years, Gideon was a great judge for Israel. But as soon as Gideon died, Israel went right back to where they were. He didn't leave a lasting impact. In fact, let's flip over real quick to chapter, what is it, 8? Trying to see where the end of it is. Chapter 8, verse 33. And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made Baal-breath their god as soon as Gideon was dead. He didn't leave a lasting impact. He, he was a great judge for the 40 years that he was a judge, but he didn't leave a lasting impact. We don't know what would, the outcome would have been had he allowed God to use him in the way that God wanted to, but my mind just kind of runs a little bit and says, well, I wonder what would have happened if Gideon would have said, okay, Lord, here am I, send me. I'll go do it. I can't do it. God, you, you've told me you're going to be with me. You think that I'm a mighty man. I don't think I'm a mighty man, but I'm going to defer to you because you're the creator. What would Gideon's life have looked like? Would it have been a lasting impact on Israel? I don't know. I can't say one way for the other because that's not what happened. But I can look at the story of Gideon and say he wasn't used how God wanted him to be. Where does that put us? Where does that put us? God's hand won the battle, not Gideon. If you have a battle in your life, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's finances. It doesn't matter if it's trying to reach somebody. It doesn't matter if it's a job that you hate. It doesn't matter what your battle is in front of you. Addictions, it doesn't matter. God is bigger than it all, but you have to let him be bigger than it all. He is bigger God could have wiped out the, the Midianites just with, you know, the sweat off of his brow. He wanted to use Gideon, 
But yet, in, for some reason, God allows us to limit him. Are you limiting God? Doesn't make sense that we would be able to because he's infinite. His pastor says he inhabits eternity. There's no beginning, there's no ending, there, there's no anything. God is. When asked who he was by Moses, God said, I am that I am. But yet he allows us to limit him. And, and we might never know what we could have been capable of. Think of all the, the pastors in the past who have gone on these great crusades for the cause of Christ and they've led crusades across America, across Europe, or across anywhere, and they've led thousands and thousands and tens of thousands or millions of people to the Lord, and you say, okay, but God can never use me like that. Well, I'm sure that they probably didn't think God could use them like that either. We'll, we'll close with this story. When we were at, um, at Servants Conference up at First Baptist Hammond a few weeks ago, they told a story of a family, and this has just stuck with me so much. They told the story of this family. It was a husband and a wife. He was getting ready to graduate college. This husband was on a bus route, and he took a special interest in a family on that bus route to try to get him into church. He went out of his way. They didn't want to come to church at first. He went out of his way to learn the names. He went out of his way to go there and to play basketball with the kids, to go to their basketball games. He went out of his way to do everything that he could to try to build a rapport with his family and get them in church. As he was doing this, he was getting ready to graduate. When they graduated, when he graduated, him and his wife were moving to, I believe, if I remember the story correctly, it was Texas. They were up in Indiana. They were driving. This was, I believe, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. As they were going down and moving down to Texas, they were driving through Tennessee at night. They came around a curve. It was really dense fog. They didn't see a 20-something car pile up in front of them. Got into a car crash and died. The husband, the wife, and the baby the wife was pregnant with all died right then. Just fresh out of college. Most people would say he lost his life. He, he didn't make a big mark for God. Let's rewind a second. He was trying to reach that family. That family eventually did get reached. The whole family got saved. The whole family joined the church. And when they were doing this, they were singing the song Faces. Have you ever heard that song? And towards the end, they opened up the doors and the whole family walked out. There had to be 30, 40 of them. That family has gone on to lead bus routes. That family has gone on to be a Sunday school teacher, to be, I believe they said, deacons in the church, to reach so many other people for Christ. Because one person sold out and said, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. It doesn't matter what happens. They opened their life to God and said, Lord, this is, what I have is yours. Use me how you want to. And they didn't see a huge yield. They saw one family. And I'm sure through time they saw others, but that one family that they poured into. And that one family has reached countless others. You might be saying, I can't make a big difference. Teenager, adult, you might be saying, I can't make a change at work. You might be saying, I can't make a change in my family. I can't make a change in my coworkers' lives. You might be saying, my, my kid has gone wayward. I can't bring him back. You can't. But God can. You might not know how, but you don't have to. Gideon sure didn't know how he was going to defeat the children of Midian. He eventually let God use him. Joseph didn't know why he was being sold into slavery and then lied about and, and held in jail and, and all of this stuff. But God used Joseph so much that he was able to save regions of the world because he let himself be used. 
Joseph didn't have that power. Daniel didn't have the power that he had. Nobody in the Bible had that power. Except for God gave it to them. And they allowed themselves to be used. God wants to use you tonight. Doesn't matter what family you come from. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter anything. You could be from the poorest family in the poorest city in the poorest country and you could be the poorest of that poor. And God says, but I want you. You can reach people that the rich people over here, they can't get to. I tell the teenagers all the time, they have a reach that I don't. I can't get into their school and reach their friends like they can. I also can't get into their families and reach their families like they can. We've got 50, 60 people here tonight. I can't get into your families and reach your families for you. I can't. I can't get into your workplace and reach your workplace for you. But you can. If you let God use you. You see, God wants to. God wants to use each and every one of us. But he also gives us the ability to limit how much he can use us. I pray that you don't limit his ability to use you tonight. I pray that you open yourself up to allow him full use of you. Because God wants to do so many things. The world was turned upside down from 12 people that got on fire for God. The entire globe was changed. Imagine if all of us in here did the same. Imagine if each person sitting in here allowed God to use us in that way. Will you let God use you? He wants to. He's waiting to. We just have to let him. Go ahead and bow in prayer. Dear God, we don't deserve your grace. Lord, we don't deserve your mercy. God, I don't know why you let us limit you, but you do. And God, I pray that we would set that aside tonight. I pray that, Lord, decisions would be made, God, in my life, to allow you full reign. Not just what I want to give you, Lord, but whatever you want. Lord, there's so much that you can do with the lives of everybody in here. God, I pray that you would just move throughout the auditorium in whatever way you see fit. This is your invitation, God, not mine. Lord, I pray that there would be just my life, God, dedicated to you to do everything that you want me to do, whether I believe it'll work or not. If you're behind it, it will. God, I pray that you would just be with us the rest of this evening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand to your feet for me, the altars are open as the instruments begin to play. Thank you for being with us this evening, and uh, be sure to keep pastoring your prayers and to be in your place come Sunday. 
Uh, ladies, if you haven't, please sign up for the activity on Saturday. Remember, there is no organized soul wedding on Saturday, but that doesn't mean you can't pass out tracks. Be sure to grab some off the uh, back table and pass them out as you go throughout your week. And thank you again for being with us tonight. Uh, Brother Robert, if you could dismiss us in a word of prayer, please.